From So Say We All and KPBS in San Diego, welcome to Incoming, the public radio series featuring the true stories of America's service members told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnall. We're spending this hour with our friend, the writer, performer, and veteran Navy officer, James Seddon. James is one of the founding members of our Veteran Writers Division, published in our first anthology, and performed on our stages all over San Diego. He's been working diligently on his memoir, but we just couldn't wait until it came out for you to meet him. So without further ado, here's today's guest, James Seddon. I'm James Seddon, and I'll be reading my story, Random Encounters. Sometimes I'm asked, what was it like in Afghanistan? It was paperwork and PowerPoint slides, car bombs and ice cream, warm showers and constant uneasiness, tediousness and grief, pride and camaraderie and guilt. A place I couldn't wait to go home from and one I secretly hoped they'd send me back to. A year that carries more meaning for me than any other. In 2012, two years after my tour in Afghanistan was over, I was on my way home from Navy Reserve duty. Ahead of me in the line at the San Francisco airport, I saw a Marine. If his high and tight haircut didn't give him away, the t-shirt he wore did. Marines were never hard to spot. His shirt had a giant red Marine emblem on it, the Eagle Globe and Anchor. It also had his unit's name, logo, and motto on it. Then, to the right of all that, it had in script, Semper Fi, always remember. Operation Mashtarak, Marja, 2010. Under that was a list of half a dozen or so names. Names of Marines with their ranks and dates next to the names. It could only be a list of unit members that didn't come home from that operation in Marja. His friends, his brothers. I didn't know if anyone else in line, any of these civilians knew, but I knew where Marja was a town in Helmand Province in Afghanistan. I had been to Helmand Province. I remembered standing on the roof of a half-finished two-story building in the Helmand village of Nawa. It was dusk on Halloween in 2009. I had been listening to a Marine captain tell me the story of his company's hard fight for the village and the support of the locals. It was a counterinsurgency success story. The village center and bazaar were growing with new shops opening, school was in planning. The half-finished building we were standing on was going to be a new district government center. As the two of us talked alone on the roof, the United States congressmen I had brought to Nawa to see all this were sharing a meal nearby with local Afghan leaders. When we first got here, that was our perimeter, the captain said, pointing down at some barriers near the base of the building we were on. And we were taking fire from that tree line. I looked across the farmer's field to a thin line of trees. It was less than a football field's length away. I shook my head. Man, sounds like tough duty. He continued. Yes, sir. It was tough, especially at the beginning. My Marines did amazing. Back then, we controlled maybe one square kilometer, just the ground under our feet. Now our ink blot's probably 10 square kilometers. The same number of Marines, 10 times the territory. Know why? I shook my head once again. The locals, they've started to trust us. They're giving us a heads up about bad guys. I don't have to have marine eyeballs on every trail. The captain pointed out and down a dirt road we could see running off out of the village and into the gathering dark. The failing light had revealed the dust in the air amid the sound of insects. It seemed peaceful. 10 kilometers down that road, though, was the town of Marja, then being held by a few thousand Taliban. The only thing standing between those thousands of Taliban and me and my congressmen was the secrecy of our visit and a few dozen of the captain's Marines. Send me more Marines and I can do there what I've done here, the captain told me. The fact of the matter was that I had brought the congressman to Nawa to see the success there and so that the Marines could ask them for precisely that. That's the idea, I said, nodding toward the congressman. The captain replied, The Taliban know you're bringing congressmen here, you know. I don't mean today. Well, I hope they don't know you're here today, but they know you're bringing them through. They're pissed about it. Well, sounds like we're doing something right then, I said with a smirk and immediately regretted it. 
If and when the Taliban decided to act on that, I probably would be back at my base in Kabul. The captain would be right here in Nawa. To be honest, I said, you can expect more congressmen. One of our biggest questions from Congress is, what does victory even look like in Afghanistan? I don't know if this is it, but it seems encouraging. They're starting to request a visit to Nawa. Word's getting out. Wonderful, the captain replied, smiling. I was just thinking what this village needed was more congressmen. One month after that Halloween visit to Nawa, the president announced he was sending 30,000 additional troops. Two months after that announcement, the young man standing in line in front of me at the San Francisco airport became one of those 30,000 and conducted a helicopter assault into Marja. The operation began the day after I left Afghanistan, my tour complete. 10 months and 50 Marine deaths later, much longer, harder, and bloodier than expected, Marja was freed from Taliban control. In some tiny, minute, cog-in-the-machine sense, I had helped make that happen, helped put that t-shirt on the young man's back. Is that what victory in Afghanistan looked like? Those memories and realizations rushed over me as I stood in the airport line behind the Marine, looking at his t-shirt and the list of names. His hair was blonde, but you could barely see it, it was so short. His carry-on looked heavy, but clearly was no trouble for him. He carried heavier loads. Part of me wanted to go up to him, shake his hand, and say, hey, I've been to Helmand Province. Except I hadn't. Not really. Not like him. My experiences of Helmand were nothing like his. Standing next to the Marine, what right did I have to claim to have been to Helmand? For that matter, what right did I have to say I was a veteran of the war in Afghanistan? At that moment, I felt more an opposite of the Marine than the civilians standing next to us probably did. The civilians had no expectations placed on them. Me? Though I was in the military in Afghanistan, more days than not I had never left the base. The Marine had spent most days outside the wire. I had slept in a bed every night. He had slept in holes he dug out of a farmer's field and in mud houses from which he had taken fire an hour before. When I had left the wire, I had prepared for, but could reasonably hope against, contact with the enemy. Contact had been certain for him on most days. I had never had to fire my weapon at other people. The enemy had never fired their weapons directly, personally, at me. I wasn't wearing a t-shirt with the names of my unit brothers on it. While I did staff paperwork, took hot showers, ate hot food, and did my tiny part to help build political support for more troops in the South, the young Marine in front of me actually did it. He was the counterinsurgent in the South. He freed Marja from the Taliban. I didn't shake the Marine's hand. I wasn't like him. I had no right to occasionally snap awake at night from imaginary bomb blasts, but I did. Next to him, there's no way I could have ever been diagnosed with PTSD, but I had been. And in those ways, I was not one of the civilians in line with us either. Did these business people and grandparents, did they know the sound of urban gunfights happening a few blocks away? Or one particularly sharp, but fortunately short firefight less than a block away? The uncertainty of things like that? Unlike the civilians, I knew what it was like to have to head down a route only hours after an IED had killed people nearby. During my tour, enough suicide car bombs had gone off within my hearing that I had lost count. Each one such an evil, dark, burdened, sickening sound. It can't be explained. One day, I ate lunch with a popular sergeant on base. We laughed and talked about nothing. Absolutely nothing. He saw my roommate and me looking for seats in the crowded defect and called us to the empties at his table. The sergeant had welcomed all new arrivals at the base orientation, and we ribbed him about the dorky impression he gave during his speech when we arrived, referring to himself in the third person several times. But soon he got up, saying, Excuse me, gentlemen, I've got things to do. Forty-five minutes later, the vehicle he was riding in was torn open by a car bomb attack, only a few kilometers from our base. Forty-five minutes. I heard the blast from our base, though at the time I didn't know the details. It had blown him clear out of the destroyed vehicle. He bled out of his severed leg before his teammates could find him. 
dying right there on the side of the Jalalabad Road. This, while I did paperwork, and while I did my best not to wonder about the blast I had just heard, tried not to wonder, as I always did when I heard them, if I would know someone. One day, a suicide car bomb detonated close enough that I watched its shockwave race toward me. Its shrapnel landed near me and my teammates, but didn't touch any of us. That one killed Afghan children I knew and loved, who hung out near the enemy's target, our base gate. And the days proceeded like the days before the attack. Lots of staff work and six hours every night in a bed, if not sleeping easy. The civilians in line around me at the airport had no idea. No idea that this added up to a very tame combat zone tour compared to combat infantrymen like the Marine in front of me. He lived the war in a way I didn't, as though I only sipped from his experience of Afghanistan at a tasting party. I wasn't with the Marine, but neither was I with the civilians. Where was I? Years later, in 2016, I found myself sharing a hotel elevator with two older ladies with short, white, permed hair, flower print shirts, and polyester pants. They were on vacation. So was I, with my family who were still waking up in the hotel room. It was early and I was on my way down to the hotel fitness center for a run. Clearly, old friends, the ladies were going to the free continental breakfast and hanging on to each other like teenage girls. Whether for excitement or stability, I could not tell. They seemed to have just gotten over laughing at some inside joke when they stepped in. One of them looked at me, smiled, and said, Third sailor, what's that? I was very confused until I remembered what I was wearing. My workout t-shirt was a desert tan. On the front left breast was a logo of a skull and two crossed rifles under it. Third sailor, it said under the logo. I opened my mouth, still trying to think of how to explain what that was, but she continued. Is that like one of those crazy things with the sails on the dry lake beds? Er, uh, no, it's a uh, sailor, someone in the Navy who served in the desert. The second one sucked in a breath. (gasps) Are you in the Navy? I was. I retired last summer. Well, thank you for your service. We think that's just great. People don't say that enough, said the first one. What did you do in the Navy? Asked the second one before I could reply. I was never sure how to answer this. I could say, I started out as a SWO, did my divo tour at sea as strike on a destroyer with one and a half deployments at Common Westpac, then navigator on a tender with a few half deployments all on Eastpac, then a short tour as a cruise missile qualifier at ATG, left active duty, affiliated with the reserves, was in a coastal surveillance unit, went IRR for nine months, was a trainer with Spay War, spent many years at the N6 shop at Pack Fleet HQ, got mobilized from there for an IA tour in the sandbox of Afghanistan for a year. Came home from that and finished my career back at Spay War. At ATG, I sure did spend a lot of time at sea during my short tour. Ha 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 ha. Instead, I said, ship driver, staff officer, some other stuff. They smiled and nodded. The doors opened and we walked out into the lobby. Who did we know who joined the Navy? Was it your cousin? Asked the first to the second. No, that was the Air Force. Are you going to run? Yes, if a treadmill's open, I said. Oh, it better be open. The sun's up, said the first, pointing at her watch. The ladies laughed heartily and I laughed at them. The first one got pretend serious. You can always tell military people because they're always in good shape. We'll let you go. We don't want to get in the way of that. I told them to have a great day and turned toward the fitness center. As soon as I turned, I heard the second one gasp again. (gasps) Were you in Afghanistan? I then remembered what was on the back of my shirt. A dark, pencil-drawn service member in full battle rattle. Helmet with goggles resting on top his eyes unseen in the shadow but clearly staring at the observer. A fabric face shield covered the rest of his face, one with a skull drawn on it that makes it look like the person himself is already among the dead. A traditional Middle Eastern scarf tucked around his neck and the neck opening of his body armor. Ammo pouches, first aid, a radio, and combat patches all adored the armor. 
he held a rifle at the ready in his gloved hands. The drawing looked photorealistic and was quite fearsome. In an arc across the top were the words, U.S. Naval Forces Afghanistan. Underneath the apparition were the words, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. I love that shirt. Ain't nothing cheaper than a Navy reservist, I like to say. And you can get them to do anything. Any shitty job or epic job, which the active duty wasn't big enough to do. I had bought the shirt from one of my enlisted sailors, another Afghanistan veteran, who was selling it as a fundraiser. She was a Navy reservist, just like me. I turned back to answer the kind-hearted lady, but the first one said, Sailors wouldn't go to Afghanistan, dear. You forgot what he said about dirt sailors. You're right. Turn back around and let me see that picture. So you were in Afghanistan? I was for about a year, I said, turning around. I dearly hoped she wasn't about to ask what it was like in Afghanistan. Did you have all that stuff in the picture? The second one asked somewhat incredulously. I was caught off guard again. These were easy questions, but even the easy questions are hard to answer. The fact of the matter was that, yes, I basically did deploy with stuff just like that. My radio was different, I didn't have the skull face shield, but yeah, I wore that battle rattle. Yet, the warrior on my shirt looked very much like a warrior, like someone who did battle, guns blazing. I was a staff officer. I never fired my weapon in combat, only in training. I moved from point A to point B, but didn't go in search of the enemy. Here the ladies were, fascinated and pleased to have met someone in the military, and friendly as all get out. Supportive, curious, appreciative, but not overly so. They didn't ask the terrible question, did you kill anyone? They were doing everything right for an encounter like this. Our chat felt good. Yet, at the same time, all I could think was that they were seeing me as if in a war movie, decked out in the garb in the picture on my shirt, doing brave and valiant things under fire and saving the day. That was totally not me. She had no bucket to put the real me in. I had no hope of explaining. I tried to answer her question about all the stuff on my shirt. Well, I did, mostly, but... Probably not the machine gun, honey, you know, said the first lady. It was not a machine gun in the picture. It was an M4 carbine and was, in fact, the very weapon I carried all over Afghanistan. One was in my hands on the roof in Nawa. But maybe she was on to the gist of it. So I just smiled the friendliest smile I could when she said I didn't have the machine gun. <laughs> yeah, I said, exactly. That was as close as we were going to come to a fit for me. She would have had no problem classifying the Marine on the roof in Nawa or the Marine in his T-shirt in the airport line or her friend or everyone else enjoying pastries and orange juice nearby. But what does one do with me? James Seddon, thanks for being on Incoming. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Let's start off with the, the first question we usually ask. Why don't you bring us into the place uh, that influenced why you joined the military? So in high school, I got this idea in my head that I wanted to fly jets for the Navy. Uh, it wasn't long into my training with the Navy that I realized how lame that would be and how much cooler it would be to drive ships for the Navy. So that's what I ended up doing. But uh, that was a big part of it. I also had my eyes set on a really expensive college, and I'm the son of a secretary and a school teacher. So if the military wasn't going to help me pay for that college, it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> what college was that? USC up in L.A. Nice. Yeah, fight on. One of the major themes in your story is about being a soldier on deployment in country, but not in a combat role. Could you speak a little bit about what goes on in that role that concerns your identity as a veteran? I'm guessing a lot of people outside the military don't realize it or think about it that, that most folks in the military don't end up in firefights. The vast majority don't end up in firefights. And, and that's either because they're in, in combat units that don't end up in firefights or they're in, not in combat units. They're in some support role of one form or another. Um, so it's really not all that uncommon. And in my case, it was even stranger because I'm in the Navy. I'm a sailor in the middle of a ground war in Afghanistan. Uh, so it was even stranger in my case. When I think about that, at the end of the day, we all volunteer and we all go where we're ordered. And then what happens when we end up where we were ordered is is so much up to chance. You know, there are 
people that looked for combat and, and signed up for that and, and never saw it. And then there were others that that was the last thing they wanted and they were in the thick of it. So much of it is up to chance that that is really, uh, it's beyond our control in a large sense. And I think that if people just remember that, you know, everybody volunteered and everybody went where they were told and, you know, what can you do beyond that? Even though, like we were just saying, the the vast majority of, of soldiers never see combat, and it's down to I think like you know in the single digit percentage that does. Um, there's a lot of unflattering terms for non combat soldiers out there in the ranks, and some are joking, and some are a little less joking. You know, like sure. coming to mind are like Remf, Fobbit, Pogue. I don't think I can unpack any of those acronyms on NPR. <sighs> um, so when you came home, and as you mentioned in your piece, on the other side of that spectrum, a lot of civilians assume that all veterans have the same experience, which is the one they see veterans having, or soldiers having, rather, on television, which is, you know, dramatic, and it always highlights the worst day of your life, and as opposed to going to the DFAC and things like that. What is it like to bounce from one extreme stereotype to another when you come home and transition out in that role? Yeah, zero to hero in one transatlantic flight, right? It, it is strange. And, you know, uh, those knuckle dragging grunts can think whatever they want about us staff guys. But no, I'm, I'm kidding. Most of that is, is good natured and, and taken that way. Although, you know, I don't begrudge anybody that, that you know, has a tough time out in the field and, and resents the, the, the comparatively easy life on the FOB. So, but it, it is odd. And, and I think that, that what we see in, in cases like this is that people love to categorize people or put them in buckets. And this goes way beyond just the military. It's just kind of a human thing. We want to put people in buckets. And uh, that happens within the military, uh, you know, with the terms that you're talking about. And it certainly happens when people outside the military look in. And, you know, part of the civil military divide is that the, a large portions of the civilians just have no idea what it's really like in the military and what how, how many jobs are and what everybody's doing. So it it is difficult because, you know, in the military, you know, everybody knows what everybody's doing and you can say what you did and everybody has a pretty good idea of what that is. But then uh, faced with civilians, especially in short encounters with people you just meet, there is really no hope of trying to explain why you're not the guy from Lone Survivor. <laughs> and yet why that doesn't mean, you know, that that you weren't in stressful situations or, or exposed to some of the dangers of of war zones. It, it's And especially with the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, it, it is very much true that your job title is not necessarily an indicator of how close you were to the trauma or hazards of war. Um, there aren't really any safe rear areas in either of those countries like you might think of in World War II. So I don't know. It's a big confusing mess, and people like to simplify that kind of thing by forming buckets in their mind and trying to dump people in those buckets. A bad day there is still worse than a bad day here, I'd argue, though. Yeah, true. My name is James Seddon, and I'm retired out of the United States Navy. And I'm reading my story, The Urchins and the Demon, which originally appeared in On Patrol, the magazine of the USO. It was a beautiful morning. I was sitting at my desk. I turned my chair to look out of the door of our office, which was left open to the outside. I was enjoying the sun and blue skies before seriously starting work. The weather was finally cooling, and the breeze felt wonderful. I could hear the morning bustle of Kabul, Afghanistan coming over the wall. Then I saw something I couldn't comprehend. It was too surreal. The picturesque scene outside was blurred. I was seeing a massive shockwave. It was huge. It raced silently, relentlessly toward me. The blast wave slammed through the doorway and into my office. It pressed me back in my chair, stealing my breath. It smashed our windows and tore things off desks, walls, and ceilings. It arrived with the loudest and sharpest sound I've ever heard. It deafened me. It sounded like the earth itself had cracked open. The air was full of dust. When I could hear again, the sounds were breaking glass, shrapnel hitting around us, curses, shouts, and screams. It was not a good day for children in Kabul. Afghan children don't know that the history of their country is one long, never-ending tragedy. They don't know they can only expect to live to be 45 years old, to live those years in poverty, and to personally know the sights and sounds of combat before they are even teenagers. They laugh, play, and scuffle. I loved meeting them. I'm sure part of it was that I missed my own son badly. One thing I lost when I deployed was daily playtime with my kid. 
The counterinsurgency field manual says, be cautious about allowing soldiers and Marines to fraternize with local children. Homesick troops want to drop their guard with kids, but insurgents are watching. It requires discipline to keep the children at arm's length. I had read this, but I made only a half-hearted attempt to follow it. I met kids all over the country. The first kids I got to know and the ones I knew the best were the street urchins. That's what my roommate and I called them. They hung around outside the front gate of our base in Kabul. There were probably a dozen regulars. I tried and failed to learn their names, which were unfamiliar and hard. I gave them nicknames instead. Tex, Runt, Bushy, Bully, etc. They begged for money or tried to sell trinkets to us. Bushy was my favorite and the same age as my son. His nickname described his sales tactics. He had several different sales pitches he would try in rapid succession. You should buy his trinket because it was the best trinket on the street, or it was a special price just for you. Sometimes he displayed reserve stock shown only for friends like you. You should buy it because he needed money for school supplies. Other times it was because he needed to buy food for his baby brother. Once it was because if I didn't buy it, his father would beat him. When all I did was raise an eyebrow at him, he couldn't get that one out without smiling. But with skills like that so young, Bushy was certainly destined to be on top of Cobble's expanding merchant class. One evening, I was working my way all alone back to my base from the U.S. Embassy. Strictly speaking, this was against procedure. It's just good sense not to travel around a combat zone alone, even on short trips. Yet, I certainly wasn't the only one that took that hike solo now and then. It was around dusk and getting dark as I hurried down the road. Bushy, my favorite urchin, was hidden behind a tree and startled me as I walked past. He was sitting on the ground cross-legged and counting his day's sails. I was anxious to get back inside the safety of my base. I said, what's up, Bushy? And kept hiking toward the safety of my base's front gate, now only a few hundred feet away. He said, Commander, wait, wait. Sorry, not now. I got to get back to work. It had been a long day and wasn't over yet. No, 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 you stay. I have something special for you. I've been saving it just for you since I know you like bracelets. This was probably another sales tactic and not any more truthful than his others. I stopped and looked back. Bushy was making a big show of searching through his pockets for the special one. I felt my pocket and there was a euro coin in there I could give him. I looked up and down the road. It was empty in the gathering dark with no vehicles or people around. The city was quieting down. The only other person in sight was an Afghan policeman manning his checkpoint not far away. He was someone that I recognized and saw often. He smirked and nodded at me. Okay, Pushy, but make it quick. I walked back and faced him with my back against the wall in the street in view. He held up the bracelet proudly and said, Two dollars, special price for you. It was actually a bit different than the others I'd bought before. All I have is one euro, yes or no. I offered him the coin and took the bracelet in exchange. Okay, for you, no problem. Now I have something else. I got a little annoyed and didn't want to be sucked into another long and sad sales pitch. I walked away quickly, saying over my shoulder, No way, you gotta go. He shouted after me, Come back tomorrow, I'll have more. Inshallah, I shouted back as I ducked through our front gate, flashing my badge at the guard. I dearly wish that I had stayed to hang out with Pushy for a while. I could have had the Afghan policeman take our picture. Somehow, out of all the pictures I took of and with kids, I don't have one of Pushy. Maybe I could have learned his real name and committed it to memory. As it happened, I didn't give Pushy another thought. I rushed to grab a bite in the chow hall and finish my pile of paperwork in time to get some decent sleep. It was two mornings later when I was sitting at my desk looking out of our open door at the beautiful day. 
the Taliban suicide bomber detonated his car bomb within feet of our front gate. Pushy was among the children hanging out around the gate that morning. He did not survive the attack. Despite my predictions, Pushy did not become a successful cobble merchant. He did not enrich himself plying the ancient trade routes through the Hindu Kush. He didn't allow his sons to attend school full time instead of selling trinkets in the street. He didn't finish school, fall in love, or even grow up. Pushy likely died only 100 feet from where I ended up trying to treat some of the wound. Why did Pushy die? Did he die because Americans like me were there and invited to attack? Did I cause his death by allowing him near our base? Did he die because I didn't follow the field manual's instructions on children? Did he die because Osama bin Laden planned the 9-11 attacks from Afghanistan? Was it his fault? The Taliban attacked that morning to prove no polling place would be safe if they could strike this close to the head of the infidel snake only five days before the election. Is that why Pushy traded away the chance to grow up? Did the Taliban find it a good trade? What about the most terrifying question of all? Is Pushy dead because I did not do enough to save him in the moments after the attack? I prepared for a gunfight against additional attackers that didn't come. I treated wounded Afghan civilians and police at the gate. I searched the wrecked barracks for survivors. What I didn't do was find and help my little friend. Maybe I search for an answer that does not exist. In war, it feels like an invisible, uncontrollable, and unpredictable force exists. A dark demon prowling the earth. It snatches anyone within reach and especially the undeserving. It isn't subject to questions or reasons. It's random. Set loose a war and you set loose the demon. You are powerless to stop it. Wishy is gone for no good reason. He just crossed the demon's path, that's all. Welcome back to Incoming with our guest, Navy veteran James Seddon. As you mentioned in your piece, operational security really stresses that soldiers shouldn't engage or let their guard down around the children they meet in country, which are everywhere, especially in urban areas. But in the big picture, there's also a lot of talk, especially from the brass and politicians, about winning hearts and minds, which has been around since Vietnam. How do you, as someone who serves on the ground, negotiate both of those points of interest on behalf of your country? Uh, it's impossible. You know, counterinsurgency is is hard, and there's it just is. There's nothing easy about it. And you've probably seen stories about the Marine General in Iraq who, whose guidance to his Marines was basically smile and shake everyone's hand and have a plan to kill everyone you meet. And that's asking, you know, young folks to, to navigate that's that world. That's what a sociopath does. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and, you know, asking them to to navigate that world, is it's just, it's amazing that anybody could do it at all. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, it was, I don't know, I sort of feel like there is no right. You know, there is no way to get that right. You know, I, I basically just ignored that field manual that says, you know, keep kids at arm's distance uh, for their safety and yours. You know, I just kind of ignored that when I first got there. And I was... I had this really naive sense of, you know, whether the bad guys would attack when kids were so close. And, and of course, after, after the, the incident at our gate, that my world changed, and I was much more likely to tell the kids to F off than I was to hand them candy for a while. But that didn't work. They were still there, and that didn't feel good either, you know. So they're, I don't know. I don't know what to say. There's just, there is no right way to do that. What do you feel like a quality, as you mentioned, having a PTSD rating, what do you feel like is the most misunderstood part of having that rating from an outsider's perspective? Going back to my buckets theory, right? People have this bucket. They have uh, someone with PTSD, and they have a picture in their mind of what that is. And it probably came from television of, of somebody who's broken, the broken hero. And, and maybe, you know, he, he's just a hot mess, or maybe he is on a hair trigger to jump in a foxhole that isn't there and, and start taking people out all around him at the Walmart, you know. It, it's People think that's what PTSD is. And like most things, it's a lot more complex than that. And 
I wish people would think of it as more of a wound or an injury. And like wounds and injuries, it's not a binary thing. You're not either wounded or you're not. You could be severely wounded or have a more minor wound. Um, and wounds are treatable. You know, wounds are manageable. You know, they're, they're, they're not permanently broken folks. Uh, and so I wish people knew enough or, or learned enough about it to have a little more nuance about it. And I, I think that people misunderstand PTSD to, to be this, you know, totally dysfunctioning danger to society when that's really not it at all. There, there's a whole range of experiences and it's, you know, most people with PTSD, if they get treatment, will get better. When you were serving in the role of uh, as escort to politicians overseas, did you feel any impulse to chip in your two political sense about what they needed to understand? And if so, what was that? Absolutely. There was no bones about that. I absolutely felt like I wanted to chip in two cents. And, and somewhat surprising to me, many of them would ask me straight out. You know, I'm just one tiny little cog in the wheel. But, you know, Senator Kerry would look at me and say, how do you think things are going in Afghanistan? And whoa, <laughs> I guess I better think about what I'm going to say next, right? It was the fall of 2009. Yeah, and he, he basically said, you know, asked me what I thought we should do. This was right in the middle of the debate over whether or not to send reinforcements. Uh, word has started leaking out that General McChrystal was going to ask for reinforcements. Kerry basically looked at me and said, should, should we send them? What do you think? And, you know, I just tried to tell him what I saw, what my experiences were. Guys like that often are pretty starved and interested in and in want. Well, what does what does the sergeant think? You know, what what does the, the the staff officer think? You know, what what am I not hearing when the generals talk? We were surprisingly given pretty good freedom to express our opinions on on that. What I told them was that I thought that the mission in Afghanistan was important, and that we had over the years sort of forgotten why we were there. That we went there for a very good reason. That the 9-11 attacks were planned from there because it was a safe haven for terrorists and it had to be made not to be a safe haven anymore. And that so many other things had been thrown in the mix, you know, women's rights and stable, non-corrupt governments and all these other things, which are important. I don't mean to say they're not important. They are important. But that's not why we went to Afghanistan. So I told him that if we stayed focused on that, that it was worth the mission, that it was achievable, that I thought we could do it. And I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that's what I told him. Mission creep is dangerous. Yeah. Could you walk us through what your experience with transitioning back to civilian life was like for you? I, I did 21 years in the military, um, six active duty, and then 15 in the reserves, and some of those reserves were back on active duty again. Uh, and you had four years in front of that. Um, there was a big portion of my life where I was – planning for or actually in the military. Uh, and so it was a little scary to hang up that part of my identity. It was harder in, in ways than I expected and easier in others. Certainly coming back from the, the tour in Afghanistan, that was a lot harder than I anticipated it would be. I'd been on deployments before, uh, figured, you know, old hat at this sort of thing, uh, sort of slept through the pre and post deployment briefs. I mean, we've done this before, my wife and I, but it was different. It was, it was a very different adjustment experience. Uh, you know, I, I changed more than I thought I did in Afghanistan. And so I think I was fortunate in that since I was a reservist, I had a civilian career cooking alongside my military career. And I was fortunate in working for an organization that is very military friendly and not all reservists are that fortunate. But giving up the identity of being in the Navy, that, that was harder than I thought it would be. The idea that there are no more grand adventures to be had is taking some getting used to. Have you been able to kind of recalibrate your thinking to find those adventures in civilian life now? Yeah, no, I, that's Having definitely... Having a 16-year-old son, I'm sure, gives you a fear, a, yeah, a spike of fear every so often. Totally, totally. And I, I have replaced, you know, time that I was spent in the military with time looking for other adventures, for, you know, trying my hand at deep-sea fishing, um, catching giant fish that all get away and that sort of thing. I do look for, for adventures elsewhere. And, you know, you, you're touching on a really good point, which is... The civilian world, in a lot of sense, just isn't as exciting as the military world. And and a lot of what's exciting about being in the military is not necessarily the day you're having that particular day because you might be pushing paper all day that day. It's knowing that not all days are going to be like that. There are going to be adventurous days. And it's it's difficult to know that that part of my life has passed.
As you've heard throughout this hour, James has a gift for talking about tragic circumstances with eloquence and honesty, but he's also really funny. Some would say in the dad humor sense of funny, but funny nonetheless. So we wanted to end our hour with James by sharing his performance at the 2017 La Jolla Playhouse's Without Walls Festival, recorded in beautiful Barrio Logan at Border X Brewing. His piece is titled Allied Weapons Systems Familiarity Training. Here's James again. Let's say you're in a ship with catastrophic flooding, said the real naval officer sitting across from 17-year-old me. And you'll have to seal this hatch to save the ship. Yet, there are still sailors below the hatch that could be saved from drowning if you kept it open. What do you do? This ROTC scholarship interview was my first interaction with the Navy and my first step to become a naval officer. I was awed and impressed with his uniform. Even idealistic 17-year-old me thought it sounded like a movie script question, though. I answered that I'd close the hatch. After all, if the ship sinks, we'd all drown. I said it with all the conceit of youth's firmly held belief that the right path will always be clear. Yeah, that's great, he said, looking down with a slight sigh and tapping his pen. Then he leaned in, set the paper down, and looked me in the eye. The hard part is in making that decision. It's doing it without knowing whether the ship would really sink if you don't close the hatch, and without knowing whether the sailors could really be saved if you kept it open. You'll be paid to make decisions, and you'll have to do it without the information that you want. At that, all sense of movie stereotypes, along with my confidence, were gone. I discovered early in my career that the warning also applied to things other than sinking ships. Five years later, 22 years old, in 1995, I was in the Northern Arabian Gulf, the Nag, as it's unaffectionately known, roaring across the oil-polluted waters in a vessel under my command, my command. Her haze-gray sides and powerful engines sent us planing over the gentle swells. It was a vessel of the class RHIB, pronounced RIB, rigid hull, inflatable boat, what civilians might call a rubber boat. She was a real beauty. The radio call sign of this mighty instrument of national defense was Steel Hammer One. Really, seriously. About as long as a small car, she had a fiberglass hull and inflatable sides. She was indestructible, the only thing the Navy entrusted to the command of a brand new officer, an ensign like me. My crew consisted of a seaman and two petty officers, all enlisted ranks, not officer. The seaman was on his first deployment, like me, and was the only one younger than me. He was my bow hook and handled the lines and radio. One petty officer in his late 20s and on his fourth deployment was my coxswain, responsible for steering the rib. The other was my engineer, responsible for the engine. He was my age, but had been in the fleet actually deploying while I was chasing girls and doing homework in college. These sailors had flushed more water than I had sailed over, and everyone in the rib knew it. I strove to be their ideal officer, by the book, but not too much, whose sailors looked up to and related to and followed to the ends of the earth. I knew I had a long way to go. My crew's mission? Deliver my friend Cunningham, the comma or communications officer, carrying secret radio codes from our anchored American destroyer to the British frigate anchored nearby. The coxswain decelerated as we approached the stern of the frigate. Gladiator, this is Steel Hammer One. Request permission to come alongside. I spoke into the model PRC radio, pronounced prick. (laughs) Steel Hammer One, this is Gladiator. Permission granted, came the reply, the voice sounding like a Monty Python character. My bow hook heaved up a line to a waiting British sailor who made it fast to the frigate's deck. Ensign Cunningham? A British officer was looking down at us. Follow me, please. I'll take you to Radio Central. The commo stood on the inflatable side of the rib, took his hand for an assist, and climbed up on the frigate's stern. She stopped and looked back down at me. Back soon, she said. We'll be here, I replied. A British sailor leaned in the shade of an overhang not far from where he had tied us up and lit a cigarette. He was there to stand watch and make sure we didn't just go romping around his ship. The early morning sun was burning through the powder-like dusty haze, 
warning of the hellish heat to come. 1995 was a tough time in the nag. I averaged four hours of sleep, split into separate two-hour naps. My ship was busy, enforcing a blockade against Iraq, escorting aircraft carriers for a no-fly zone, spying on Iran, and anxiously watching Iranian military units as they harassed us, guarding other Navy ships while they were at anchor in my part, practicing firing dozens of tomahawks into Iraq. The probability of a real order to do so was high, and today's mission was to get the radio coach to the British frigate so we could do an exercise together and demonstrate international resolve. I was overwhelmed. <laughs> the downtime waiting for the comma was welcomed. I had no duty to perform other than to stay with the rib until she returned. I knew I could get that right. The sun felt warm on the dark blue uniform coveralls I wore, and I pulled my ship's ball cap down over my eyes. This uniform, designed for boat and boarding operations, perhaps on unfriendly ships, was plain with no rank insignia or name on it. I was amused at the thought of getting paid to sit there with my eyes shut. My crew were chatting quietly. I kicked my steel-toed booted feet up when a British voice interrupted my daydreaming. I heard the Americans had landed. I wanted to come see for myself. You don't look so scary. I peered up under the lid of my ball cap at a short, stocky, young British sailor with a smiling broad face. He was wearing dark blue coveralls with a petty officer's insignia and had his hands in his pockets. You haven't seen us on Liberty, my cox encountered. Some banter ensued between the Brits and my crew, but I stayed out of it. Officers could sometimes shut down conversations with their involvement. So I kept my relaxed pose, hat covered my face, and listened. So it's true you're not allowed to have alcohol on board, the Brit asked. Yep, sad, isn't it, my coxswain said. We were aware that British ships served alcohol. Well then, want to come have a beer? My eyes widened. I'll take you blokes down to the petty officer mess and show you how Her Majesty's Navy does things. This chap here can watch your boat for you, he said, pointing to the British sailor standing watch. My sailors in the rib slowly turned their eyes on to me. Their faces told me what they thought the answer should be. The heavy weight of command settled on me. First off, a beer sounded really good. Secondly, a beer sounded really good. Thirdly, getting a beer would score serious points with the sailors. Movies portray military officers barking orders to instantly obedient subordinates. In reality, it's a complex relationship. There could come a time when these sailors would be able to cover for me or save me from making a terrible mistake. The time might come when I'd have to order them to do something extremely unpleasant or even dangerous. Whether they would depended on far more than the rank I held. Rapport built up prior to that situation could be crucial. Yet, I would be violating naval regulations if we had a beer. Commanding officer standing orders and operational Navy instructions 5350.4 and 1700.16 and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, Articles 92, 133, and 134. They all forbid leaving the boat uncrewed, drinking on duty, drinking on a ship, conduct unbecoming a gentleman, conduct of bringing discredit, and failing to obey an order, and they all ended in the word court-martial. Career over. Since I was 14, all I wanted to do was be a naval officer. But I could leave someone behind with the radio. But then someone would be innocent. No, no, best that we're all guilty. <laughs> Stay behind myself and send my crew for a beer? No, I wanted to make sure the drinking didn't get out of hand. Plus, that would mean no beer for me. If we got caught, I'd just have to frame it as a bad judgment call. We were sustaining NATO operations through diplomatic means. Ensigns, as brand new officers, were well known for terrible decisions. Careers, court martials, and beers swirled my head. The ship wasn't sinking, but the officer recruiter told me there'd be days like this. <laughs> I thought about my future self. Which story would I rather tell after I got out of the Navy? Hand me the prick, I said. <laughs> my sailor shifted with suppressed grins. The bow hook handed over the radio. In the name of leadership, I would lie. I called our ship. Steelhammer, this is Steelhammer 1, over. I told our destroyer that we were going offline for training, implying that it would be on navigation or safety or engine maintenance or something. It would cover if they called us and we didn't answer. This is Steelhammer, roger out. 
came the reply. Smirks turned into smiles. I said, sure, let's go. We'll call it Allied Weapon System Familiarity Training. The inside of the British ship looked like an American ship. Linoleum-like decks, white-painted bulkheads, hatches, knee knockers, fire stations, uncountable wires and pipes, emergency power connections, battle lanterns. The Brit opened a hatch, and we stepped into the petty officer's mess. It was the size of a couple of office cubicles put together and was the lounge for enlisted sailors. There were bar stools along one bulkhead, and along the other bulkhead was a beautiful dark wood bar, just like you'd find at a pub in England, only smaller. I'd never seen anything like it on a ship. We settled into the seats and the Brit stepped behind the bar. He started pulling beer glasses out of the holders. I realized how far from the boat and radio we were. Remember, we have to be back at the boat before the commo is, I said. Just a quick beer, said the Brit. Wow, this is real nice, said my coxswain. The petty officers don't even have a mess on our ship. The officers have their wardroom, the chiefs have one. Nothing for us. At that comment, I realized I was in violation of another directive, this one far older. I was an officer in the enlisted petty officers lounge. Officers were allowed only on strict and rare invitation. It was important for crew sanity to have areas where enlisted members could gather without fear of an officer barging in. This was theirs. I was probably the first officer ever to set foot in here. Thanks, said the Brit as he started pouring beers. We're proud of it. We think it's as good as the chief's mess, though they'd never admit it. But compared to the wardroom, well, you know officers, he rolled his eyes. I didn't hesitate. Yeah, f***ing officers. <laughs> My sailors laughed hysterically. The Brit chuckled, but in an awkward way, and handed out his beers. I stretched my arms out, smelled the beer, listened to my sailors talk. For the moment, I forgot where I was. It was relaxing. I lost track of time. There might have been refills. The beer was brown and foamy and luscious. It was good. No, no, it was better than good. It was I'm stuck in the nag for months, and the last beer I had was 5,000 miles ago in Singapore, and the beer in Singapore sucked. So to hell with it, Captain, and f*** those regulations. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm drinking on duty. <laughs> kind of good. <laughs> the voice of God coming from a wall speaker slammed me from my bliss down to the deck. Ensign Sedden, please contact the bridge. My sailors turned and looked at me. Who's Ensign Seddon? asked the Brit. Is that your commo? My crew went silent. My engineer sipped his beer and looked sideways at the wall. Ensign Seddon, please contact the bridge. I pursed my lips. I pulled a wall phone off its hook. What's the number to the bridge? I asked the Brit. The Brit's smile was gone. His brow was furrowed, and he answered slowly, 47999. This is Ensign Seddon, I said when the bridge answered my call. What the hell, the Brit swore, realizing at once that an officer was in his petty officer mess and that he was helping American sailors break regulations in front of an officer. On the phone, the comma was wondering where the hell we were after having gone down to the boat to find it unattended. I said, we'll meet you there. I turned back to the Brit. He looked like he couldn't decide if I was in trouble with him or if he was in trouble with me. Thanks, I said. This was very awesome, but duty calls, and I extended my hand. A moment passed. Oh, what the hell? Come back any time, he shook my hand, beaming. At the stern, again, I was glad to see the rib was right where we had left it. The British sailor who was supposed to be watching it was nowhere to be seen. But since it had not come untied or sunk, it was one bullet dodged. When the commo appeared, I said, I'll tell you later. When I finally did, she was pissed. It was totally unfair that I was having a beer while she worked. She never told on us, though, and neither did any of the crew of Steel Hammer One. We never acknowledged it, aside from looks that only insiders can give. On the way back to the ship, I said, I think you saw all those bad teeth back there, so let that be a lesson to us. I think it's probably a really good idea if we all brushed our teeth as soon as we're back aboard and before talking to anyone. <laughs> the coxswain replied, aye, aye, sir. 
Dental hygiene is very important. Thank you. James Seddon, everybody. The last question, if you were to meet somebody who's in active duty right now and they're about to transition out in, say, the next couple weeks, maybe month tops, you can give them one piece of advice, what would it be? Realize that it's going to be hard. Transitioning to a civilian is going to be hard. Uh, despite what the recruiter told you when you signed up, employers are not going to beat down your door to give you a job offer. Not everybody sees your military experience as a positive for their organization. And when that offer does come, it's going to be lower on the food chain than you think you deserve. That's going to be harder than the recruiter told you. Um, and other things are going to be harder, too. Your relationships are going to be strained in, in ways that you don't expect. Uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges, a lot of obstacles. But, and this is the huge but, uh, I would advise uh, him or her to remember uh, where he or she has been, what he or she has accomplished. Uh, you know, compared to 90% of the population that's never served in the military, the obstacles they have overcome, the things they have accomplished, the things they have seen and heard and done and been, they got this. They got this transition thing. They can do it. Just don't underestimate it. James Seddon, thanks so much for being on Incoming. Uh, it's an honor to be here. That's our show. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnell. Jennifer Corley is our editor and sound designer. Songs featured in James Seddon's stories were by Mpex, Pottington Bear, and Inner Struggle. At KPBS, Kirk Conan is radio production manager, Nate John is innovation specialist, and John Decker is program director. Funding for Incoming is made possible by the KPBS Explorer Program, the California Arts Council's Veterans Initiative and the Arts, and the supporting members of So Say We All. You can find more of us at SoSayWeAllOnline.com and drop us an email at info at SoSayWeAllOnline.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again soon.